Hello, I am Tropples, and here's how I solved Sprint, a reverse engineering task of Google CTF Qualifiers 2020. I was really impressed by this challenge because it implemented a mind-blowing concept, namely an architecture where all instructions are encoded and run as printf format strings. The binary implements a weird 16-bit architecture with 9 registers. It exclusively uses printf as the mechanism that advances the program state. That means that arithmetic operations, memory reads and writes, and control flow are all accomplished as some very intricate format strings. All in all, this machine surprisingly is Turing complete. Reversing the VM program, we find it first runs the sieve over orthosthenes to calculate all prime numbers less than 256. Then, using the prime numbers, it decodes a maze. Our input is then used as a path through the maze, and if it hits 9 predefined checkpoints in order, it uses the input path to decrypt the flag. Stick around for a more detailed explanation of each step. One of the first steps I take when reversing a binary is taking a look at the strings and or the binary's contents. In this case, I was surprised by many complicated looking strings, which at a second glance turn out to be format strings. In the main function, we can see some user I.O., initialization, and then a lovely site, the familiar VM core loop. It checks whether the instruction pointer has a specific final value and otherwise uses the sprintf function to advance the program step by step. We also notice some important ranges in the VM memory, namely E000 for the password, FFFE being the hold address, 7400 is set when the password is good, and E800 is the decrypted flag. Also, 6 hexillion is used as a sprintf buffer, though this is outside the VM's memory space. Before diving into the format string logic, let's take a look at the parameters sprintf receives. We see the code pointer, an empty string, a null pointer, the sprintf buffer itself, and both the value and address of the 9 registers. This multitude of arguments allows the format strings to use the dollar syntax to selectively work with only some of them. For example, here's a simplified way of writing the value 10 to register 2. The first format says use parameter 1, the empty string, and pad it to length 10. This will print 10 space characters. The second format says to store the number of bytes printed so far, which is 10, as a 16-bit value at the address given by argument 9, which is the address of register 2. Notice that not all arguments are used, and we can also use the same argument multiple times. Thus, the argument list is just a list of options. It doesn't mean that all calls to sprintf will use all of the supplied arguments. We currently don't know very much about how the instructions work, other than that they're format strings. But let's start automating the analysis with Python, as this will make the internals even clearer. This is some boilerplate code I basically rewrite every time I write a disassembler, but I figured I'd cover it here as well. First, we read the code from a file. Then we create a queue of addresses we have to visit. A dictionary which stores the disassembly strings for each address, as well as a dictionary of references so we can more easily track jumps. While the analysis queue is not empty, we get an address from the queue to disassemble. If there already is some disassembly at this address, that is, if it has already been visited, just skip it. Since the instructions are null terminated C strings, we can get the current instructions bytes by starting with the instruction address and stopping at the first null byte. Then, we use the decode instruction function, which we will have to write to get the disassembly text for this instruction, as well as a go to list. This go to list contains possible addresses which will be executed after this instruction runs. It will either be a single value inside basic blocks, the address of the next instruction that is, or it can be an array of values after a conditional branch. After a few checks that the goto variable makes sense, we enqueue all the addresses and set any relevant references. After all this ends, we print the disassembly. You can see I use this format address function, but it's only for eye candy, nothing highly functional, just formatting. Using this rather basic decode instruction function, we can check that the disassembly engine indeed works. It doesn't provide much insight, of course, as it just prints the bare format strings, but it does indeed verify that our code works. 
Now we have to implement the decode instruction function, which will extract the relevant information from the format strings. We'll first split the format string into quote-unquote actions, which are the individual percent thingies. What we can notice is that there are only ever S, HN or C actions, so we'll just assert that to double check. This getArg function decodes which argument of the 23 is being used by this action. Then we look at the action type. If it ends with an S, it's a string print. We'll get a padding field and try to transform it to a hex number. If it ends in HN, it's a memory write. And if it ends in C, it's a character print. If we look at the output, we now see the instructions being split into something akin to micro instructions, which we can better understand. For example, we notice this pattern of three micro instructions. Write the empty string pad into some value, store the length, which is that value, to code pointer, and then write exactly the 16 bit opposite of the initial value, thus resetting the lower 16 bits of the count to zero. This is a go to and it dictates the unconditional program flow. Let's add a special case to the instruction decoder to use this new knowledge. If the instruction matches this pattern, where the second action is a store to the code pointer, set the go to value to the padding of the first action. Additionally, if the instruction also has a third action, as all but a few do, make sure that its padding does perfectly cancel out with the first one's padding. Finally, delete these first two or three actions because we already parsed them. Here's how the output looks like now. Getting closer, we can notice that most instructions look like moves or simple additions, but what's up with this weird star dollar syntax? If you're the average C programmer, you of course know about printf. Maybe you also had to use the dollar syntax once or twice, but it's rather rare you see the variable padding syntax, which looks kinda like the dollar syntax but also has a star at the beginning. This tells printf to pad the string not by a constant, but by the value passed as the referred parameter. For example, in our code we have this format string. It has both the normal dollar syntax, which tells printf to use argument number one as the content, as well as the star dollar syntax, which tells printf to pad the string by the value of the eighth argument. What this means in our adding machine is that beside adding constants, we can also add the values of registers. For example, at L6C, it adds the eighth argument, which is the value of register 2, and then the constant 2, and then stores all of that to register 1. Thus, it implements a register 1 equals register 2 plus 2 instruction. Let's go back to our Python code and implement these sums and moves. First, the getPad function should now know about non-constant padding. If there is no star, we can just parse the number between the dollar and s as we did before. If there is though, we'll use the getArg function to get the register corresponding to the argument after the star. Now, inside the instruction decoder, we'll look for instructions that match this pattern of a bunch of strings and then an hn. Count up all their constants and registers which are added to the output buffer, then find where they're stored. Using all of this, we emit some nicely formatted pseudocode. Here's how the disassembly looks like now. So much better. We can clearly see some initialization, memory operations, arithmetic operations. It's great. There's one last kind of instruction we're not decoding yet though, and we'll cover that next. To understand how conditionals work, let's look at the first instruction we can disassemble. Transforming it to pseudocode might look like so. Write a byte corresponding to the value of a register, write a constant number of bytes, write a null terminator, weirdly, then write the buffer itself, but only up to the first null byte since it's a C string, remember. Then we write another constant and finally we store the total bytes written to the code pointer. The very important bifurcation that happens here is that if the register we check is zero, the total length will be shorter than if it's not. In Python speak, the instruction might look something like this. And resolving the calculations in 16-bit arithmetic, we get the final disassembly. If register 5 is 0, go to 384, else go to 804. Let's finally implement this in the instruction decoder. 
As we did before, we'll check if the current instruction matches the conditional jump signature. That is, the first action is a character print, then a string print of constant padding, then a null byte, then the buffer itself, then another constant, and then a code pointer write. This is kind of excessive, since only a small subset of those checks would correctly match, but oh well. Then, we get the register that is checked and the two constants. Since this is a conditional jump, the goto list will have two entries, for true and false, give, given by these formulas. Finally, we will generate some convenient disassembly text. And look at the beautiful code we now get. Isn't it amazing? We have now successfully disassembled the virtualized program. Let's also understand what it does. I'll go over the main parts of the program, as the whole reverse engineering process is rather tedious and not very captivating. The first part initializes a 256 element array at address 7000. Elements 0 and 1 are set to 1. Then we enter a loop which counts from 2 up to 255. For each iteration, if the array is already set at that position, we skip it. Otherwise, we start a nested loop with a counter at twice the value of the outer counter, which goes up to 256 in increments of the outer counter. For each iteration of this inner loop, we set the corresponding element in the array. We should recognize this algorithm is the sieve over Eratosthenes, which calculates prime numbers. Thus, in the array, a zero element corresponds to a prime index and the one corresponds to a composite index. On to the next bit, this one is simpler. It uses a pointer to the password input, advances it till it gets to a null byte, at each step decrementing a value which turns out to be the negative of the length of the password string. After that, it checks if the negative length plus 254 equals zero, and if it doesn't, that is, if our password is not 254 bytes long, it exits with a failure. So we know the password must be 254 bytes long. Now here come the more complicated parts. We do some initialization, then there's a big loop which doesn't really fit in one screen, but it starts by getting the next character in the password, the index being registered 2. If it's 0, so it reached the end of the password, it ends the loop. Then it sets register 6 to one of four values if the character is the letter U, R, D, or L. This is very important, and with a little bit of intuition, we can figure out a lot about the following code just with these values. The connection we have to make is that U, R, D, L stand for up, right, down, left. If we have a 16 wide map indexed like so, moving up a cell corresponds to the index going down by 16, moving right increments the index by one, moving down adds 16 to the index, and moving left subtracts 1. All of these perfectly match what the program is setting up, so we can reasonably expect the code that follows to move around the 16 wide map based on the letters in the password using reg6 as the offset. Back to the code. Now that it has the correct offset in register 6, it adds it to register 4. Therefore, register 4 must be the position. Then, it checks if it's still within 0 and 255, otherwise it fails. This tells us the height of the map is also 16. Then, it uses the position to index into an array at F000. This has got to be some sort of a map. Afterwards, it checks if the byte in the map is prime or not. We'll see what it does if it is prime later, but if it isn't, it sets register 5 to 0, then repeats the loop. This is important, as we see that after the loop, if register 5 was ever set to 0, that's a fail. So that means the numbers from the map must always be prime. If we ever give a command to move to a position with a composite number, we will fail. Earlier, register 5 was also set to 0 if the input byte was none of U, R, D, or L. So we know that all password bytes must be one of these, otherwise we fail. Also, after the loop, we see that register 3 must be 9, or otherwise we fail. We'll see what that means in the next bit of code. Here's the bit of code it runs whenever we move to a cell which is, has a prime number in the map. It's not very long, but its function might not be initially obvious. First, it retrieves a byte from a predefined array at an index given by register 3. 
then it uses it to compare the position, and if they match, it advances register 3 by 1. On the left is that array, as well as the position values that match each array value. What this actually implements is a sort of a checkpoint system. Register 3 knows the number of the last touched checkpoint, and as we move through the map, if we hit the next point given by the value in the array at index reg3 plus 1, it advances reg3, so our goal moves to the next checkpoint. We know it checks the number of hit checkpoints to be 9 after the whole loop, so we know we must hit all 9 of them in order. Let's write a quick Python script that draws the map, the places we can work on, and the checkpoints. We'll first open the code file and seek to the start of the map data. Read the 16 by 16 map as well as the checkpoints, then iterating through all cells of the map. See what checkpoint byte might match this position, and if it is one of the actual checkpoint bytes, display the checkpoint on a blue background. Otherwise, check if the map cell is a prime number and display it on a white background, as this means we can walk on that cell. But if it's neither a checkpoint nor a walkable cell, just display the number on black. And here's the output of that. It looks like a maze and we can see we need to hit the checkpoints in order from x0, x1, x2, all the way up to x9. We can already plan the path. From checkpoint 0 to 1 we go like this, from 1 to 2 like so, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and so on, and so forth. To see how to decrypt the flag, we have to analyze one last block of VM code. It does 39 iterations, in each one using 4 characters from the password and concatenating them each as 2 bits to form an 8-bit value. A U turns into two binary zeros, an R becomes 0, 1, D becomes 1, 0, and L becomes 1, 1. For example, the moves up, up, left, left would turn into 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, or the numerical value 15. This packed value is then added to some bytes starting at address F10C to obtain the flag. That was all quite a lot to go through, so let's recap. In the first part, we found the binary uses clever printf format strings to virtualize a weird machine. Then, we slowly tackled each instruction type and wrote a disassembler to be able to understand the emulated program. In the beginning, it starts with an implementation of the sieve of Eratosthenes. This is an algorithm that calculates prime numbers. Then, the length of the input password is checked to be 254. Then we enter the first big loop. Here, the password is interpreted as a series of up, right, down, or left commands, which are used to walk a cursor through a maze. The way it works is that we have a 16 by 16 matrix of random looking numbers, but if we only select the ones which are prime, the maze is revealed. This is why we needed to run the sieve at the start. We start at position 1, 1, and we have to touch all of these checkpoints in order. If the path takes us to all of these checkpoints, it then uses the password to generate a bunch of numbers. Each sequence of four commands of the password is turned into an 8-bit value, and those values are added to bytes of the encrypted flag to decrypt it. We now have everything almost ready. Just get the encrypted flag bytes from the dump, use the sequence of correct moves, get pairs of four moves for the key bytes and calculate the binary stuff, which then are added to the encrypted data to get the flag. Here it is being run and awesomely it works. Thank you very much for watching. The challenge was awesome, the printf concept was mind-blowing, and the implemented program did not disappoint either. This is the sort of task I love to keep seeing in high-quality CTFs. Bye-bye!